As I said a moment ago, it's a joy for my wife Linda and I to be here with you. We're just down the road in Granbury. We live, actually live in De Cordova, uh, if you know where that is. And so, uh, uh, and I have known some of your pastors. I've been retired a long time, but uh, I've worked on the staff at Acton for about 15 years and been over at First Church Granbury for a couple of years and served there as an interim pastor until our new pastor, we have a clergy couple, Steve and Cynthia Moss. But I remember Buddy Stegman was a pastor here at one point. And Buddy and I were in seminary together at Perkins. And, and even to go way back, I noticed it looked like Floyd Thrash might have been one of the founding pastors of the church. And I'm old enough to remember Floyd in his later days. <laughs> Most of you probably don't. But, but he was a, a grand gentleman and a, and a good preacher and uh, one of the fine people that I, I remember, and, and I know there's been some others, I just can't remember who they are right now. So, but at any rate, this is the day, the time of the Epiphany. On January 6th will be Epiphany, the day of Epiphany, and we mark this as Epiphany Sunday. That's the manifestation of, of Jesus' life coming into the world. When the, the, the wise men, or the magi, as they're sometimes called, Follow the star and, uh, to Bethlehem. And so, if you would hear these words from Scripture. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came from Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observe the star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Well, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where this Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judea, for all you shall come a ruler who is a shepherd of my people, Israel. Well, then Herod secretly called the wise men and he learned from them the exact place where the star would appear. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child and when you have found him, bring, him the word, bring me the word so that I may go and pay him homage. Well, when they had heard the king they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen since its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they stopped. They were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, the mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. But having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left and went to their own country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a time of uncertainty, in a time of pandemic like ours is today, we kind of sometimes wonder, I suspect, about all the uncertainty and loss that we, we have faced. In a time of fear of an unknown future, what does the t word epiphany or what does the event of epiphany you know, say to us? A couple of quick things to repeat. It is the manifestation of the light of the world in Jesus coming into the world. And the wise men followed that star to the manger and brought it life and light into the world. And may I suggest to you that even in a time like this, following that star and that light brings not only a lot of relevance, but a lot of insight and comfort to whatever we might be going through, either personally or in the world. 
Because it seems to me one of the great adventures of Jesus was always the gift of God to us to bring light into a darkened world. And to be sure, that time was a very dark time, of course. It was a time when there was a lot of unrest and chaos and confusion and not sure which direction the world is going. Sound familiar? Doesn't seem like things have changed a whole lot, has it? Just the details, it seems. But what does that mean for us? Consider this, that the Christian message is precisely what you were singing about a moment ago. It is the Emmanuel. It is the God who is with us. And what a difference that makes, folks. That, that light of Jesus is in the world, and it belongs not only to some long ago time, but to all of us down through the centuries that still follow that light and claim it on our own and find meaning and purpose and direction for us. There's two or three things I think are important about this. And it kind of feels like this. That God showed us His love in the gift of Christ. God showed us His love in the gift of Christ. It was a hurting and dark world, as I was saying, waiting for the light, waiting for the Messiah. And it came in a very strange way in the, there's the Bethlehem. But love is the greatest because I think of one great attribute is gratitude. If we understand that even in a troubled world and in a darkened world, there's light in the world, if somehow we can find a way to be grateful, it somehow frees our spirit and our souls in, in such a way that it brings a sense of really grace. If you remember the, the, the novel, not novelist, but the writer, Irma Brombeck, you, you have to be as old as I am probably to remember her. But she was so funny and, and so delightful. And yet, tragedy struck her at a relatively young age with a fatal and terminal disease. And like most people that would face a situation like that, she struggled with that for a while. But finally one day she woke up and said, I believe that the grace of God is even in the midst of all of this. And I choose to look at the world a lot differently than I have. I'm going to let a lot of those past hurts I have in my life just go and deal with the beauty I see around me and the liveliness of children and the liveliness of the beauty in the world. And it made her all the difference in the world. I'm retired and I don't do very much clergy type work anymore. But as it happens, I've been involved in two funerals just this week. One from a longtime friend of mine who was suffering from that dire disease of ALS, a lateral, sclerosis, a lateral sclerosis. It's a terminal 100% of the time disease. And yet Bill faced it with a great deal of courage over the years, and he lived to be 82 years old. But he was an interesting character, if you knew him. I won't take the time to describe him, but uh, he never met a stranger, and he was always up, and, and he always had a very positive view of life, even to the very end. But even in, the, even in his last days, when he really couldn't function very much, that we would call functioning, he still had a spirit about him, and he could always find something positive to say and affirming to you just when you went to be in his presence. And I suggest to you that even in that moment, that's light and bringing light into a dark world, and that's the very sense of what Epiphany is about. And one of the things I'd say at his funeral, and I say as many others, that I think God's greatest gift to us really is the gift of gratitude and the gift of memory. And listen, I've lived long enough and I've had enough life experiences. I know not all memories are good. Like we said, I've got a whole closet full of them that I really don't care much about, you know. But at the same time, I've also lived long enough to know that those kind of bad memories need to be left where they happen. And that was in the past. 
Because otherwise they chain us to a time or a place or an event that just doesn't matter that much anymore. Life is for living, and life is for living here and now and going forth with faith. And good memories help us do that. My wife and I both have lost spouses in our time. And fortunately and gratefully, we've, we've found each other. And that's been a, a very fulfilling and meaningful uh, duration for us. Uh, interestingly enough, we've known each other since we were in high school together, or actually even the sixth grade. <laughs> It took about 50 or 60 something years for all that to come around and a whole bunch of bad experiences sometimes. But the point is, it happened. And we're both grateful for that. Gratitude is important, folks. Even when it's not, you don't think you have anything to be grateful for. Faith teaches us that this Christmas thing, as they say in the hymn Silent Night, this is the dawn of redeeming grace. That we, grace can be redeeming at any point in our lives, and that fulfills our lives. I mean, that's the light of Christ that came into the world that night. And the second thing is this. God's gift to us is Christian hope. Hope is a very important thing for us to have, I think. And how it relates today is like the wise men following that star. That was not only inconvenient for them, it was dangerous, and they were sent on a mission even by Herod to come and tell them where the child was because Herod's intentions was not to go pay homage, as we know. It was to do dire things and to destroy. But somehow the wise men, even in the danger of offending their leader, took the light of faith and went another way. And that brings hope into the world. It, uh, I think a special God comes to us in a very special way, folks, especially when we're broken. And we're all broken from time to time. And sometimes even when society is broken and when we have this awful pandemic that breaks us all, there's still hope in the light of Christ. And I think God comes to us that we're maybe even more receptive, if you will, when we're hurting and when we want someone to reach out and give a calming hand. As you know, or probably know, the actress Betty White passed away a few days ago. And she was just a few days shy of her 100th birthday. And, and what a talented person she was, and, and in so many levels, really. And, and, and yet she suffered uh, early on in her life, if you may remember. She, the love of her life was a, another uh, commercial star with him, Alan Ludden. He had game shows and the like way back there. And they were married for just a few years, and he died very suddenly. And she was racked with grief about that. And, and even all these years later talked about that he is the love of her life and she's anxious to see him again. And he's been gone for decades, really. But somebody asked her, what is your secret to life? And, and she was a great animal lover and, and gave it to many different charitable causes. But she said, I think I got this from my mother. My mother was what that song, Cockeyed Optimist, you know. She would always find hope in the most dire of situations. And somehow that passed on to me. And so far I've said when something like bad happens to me like that, I look for the light in it, for the darkness. Look for the hope that there's usually something there that I can grab onto and push the darkness away. That's what Epiphany is about, folks. It's about seeing that light, living that light, and going to it, even in the darkest night. Not only in Bethlehem, but in Benbrook, too. And finally, I think the last thing is this, that Epiphany brings the light, gives us the power to heal our hearts. God is a loving God, a healing God. And you were one of the, uh, many years ago, I kind of got 
hooked on a little book called The Gospel According to Peanuts that was written by a man by the name of Robert Short. And when I was in seminary in the late 60s, it was a book that spoke a lot to me because that actually was not a very good time for me. There was a whole lot of negative stuff going on in my life, and I was struggling to get through that. And the, the details of that would take way too long to tell. But I remember one particular thing that Short talked about in the theology, if you will, of the Peanuts Patch. And Lucy, you know, you know uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Peppermint Patty and Charlie Brown were talking. And, and Peppermint Patty asked Charlie Brown, he says, what do you think security is? And Charlie Brown thought for a moment and he says, you know what I think security is? It's being in the car with mom and dad, and I get sleepy, and I can lay down in the back seat and go to sleep because mom and dad are up there and they're driving and they're in charge of everything. And if anything happens, they'll take care of it. And I can just sleep as soundly, as safe and secure as I want to be. And Peppermint Patty says, wow, that's wonderful. But what happens when we grow up? And we're not, we can't sleep in the back seat anymore. And mom and dad aren't in the front seat. And what happens to our security then? when We can never be the same way again. Charlie Brown thought for a moment and a little bit put, not sure what to do. He says, Hold my hand, Patty. <laughs> Hold my hand. And it seems to me, folks, that when we are insecure, that we have someone to hold our hand. That's what God is about in the Christ child. It is God saying to us, we have someone to hold your hand. Jesus came to save and to redeem and to deliver and to strengthen and to tell us that He loves us and that you're not alone. You're never alone. You don't have to face the hard times in life all by yourself. You have someone, not only in spirit, but someone to walk with you. And that's the joy of Christmas, it seems to me. You know, we've all just experienced Christmas, and, and hopefully it was a grand time for you. And hopefully we, we, had, we had parties, and we had family, and we had a, a one helping others, and there were children or grandchildren around, perhaps. And, and, and uh, you, you see, my wife, she's much older than me, like, no, actually I'm the oldest one, aren't I? I forgot. Two, she, <laughs> we're two weeks apart, I forget. <laughs> But, but, but she's a great grandma. <laughs> and she's got two great grandkids. You know. I don't, I've got loving kids, grandkids. But, but they're so much fun, especially at Christmas. And especially the one-year-old that, that chose to redecorate our Christmas tree by removing the balls from it systematically. <laughs> much to the chagrin of her parents. And they would stop her and, and sit back and we'd go about what we were doing. And it wouldn't be but a few minutes before she was back at it again. And she was very dedicated to that. <laughs> and that's wonderful Christmas memories that, that we cherish the like. But it's very, very easy, isn't it, to go back to the dark. You know, with the reality around us like Charlie Brown, we're not secure. We can't sleep safely in the back seat anymore. But we have someone to hold our hand. And the message of the epiphany is this. This is the new way of God loving us. The new way in Christ. The new light in Christ. And I'll finish with this. Many years ago, in that seminary years I was talking about, Things were not going very well for me. I was a young preacher, and I, uh, I won't tell the whole story. It would take too long. But I, had a, I was married. We had a child that was about a year and a half old. 
And finally, my wife at the time decided that she really didn't love me anymore and quite literally put our baby in my lap and says, I don't love you, I'm leaving. And she did. And it so happens that was a Sunday morning and as George Strait said in one of his songs, what a rotten day that turned out to be. You know? <laughs> Well, and the point was, I learned a lot about the church through that, even in that dark moment. Because I had not been at these little churches down in Hill County, uh, uh, Abbott and Brandon and Bynum very long, just a month or two. Anyway, it came to me to tell them kind of, I didn't go into any detail about it, just kind of what happened. That I was sorry about that, and we had worked on it for a long time, and we had, and thought we, it was going to work, but it didn't and pray for her and pray for me, but I still would like to be your pastor. And so that day, the, uh, the parishioner becomes the pastor to the pastor. To my dying day, I will never forget Dolly Gray, who was the lay leader of the congregation. His actual name was Otis, and why he was called Dolly, I never knew, but he was six foot four and, and, and a big guy that played baseball in the for the University of Texas, so I guess he could be called anything he wanted to, and he liked that term, Dolly. Because he really was a doll in a way, because he walked up and put his big old arms around my shoulders and pulled me close. And he says, and we're so sorry what has happened to you and to your family. But we are the church. And the church is on both sides of this pulpit. And we're going to be here for you. And we're going to help you just as you continue to lead us. In that moment, that saved a young preacher because I would have probably just gone back to Dallas and found a job doing something else. But in that moment, I saw the light of Christ. I might not have been able to use those words then, but the light of Christ in the darkness of my life. And that very night on the way back, I, lived, I stayed in, in the dorm in Dallas during the week. And on that way back, I heard a rebroadcast. This was in July, actually. And the pastor's sermon with the First Presbyterian Church, actually, was preaching about Christmas in July. And ever since that time, I've always said, Christmas is wasted just one day a year. It should be all year long in so many ways. But anyway, he told a story that I'm going to tell the first person because it really tracked very much a real life experience for me. I grew up in a grain beer that's very, very different than today, <laughs> trust me. It was small and rural and kind of a one-horse town. I don't even think we had a horse, you know. And it was, uh, but I lived on the river, which is now the lake. And I was a river rat. And I was about 10 years old or so. And I had friends in the neighborhood and we'd play and we'd go down to the river and play around and whatever. But one day there was no one around. The kids were all gone somewhere else and I wanted to go. And my mother said, no, you don't go out today. Don't go down to the river, you know, because you'll be alone. Well, I don't know if you've ever had 10-year-old sons or grandsons, but um, telling them no about that age isn't really kind of a waste of breath, mostly, because I was sneaky. I waited till she was busy doing something, and off I went. And sure enough, I got I tripped on a rock and kind of skinned myself against the tree, and I was hurting and crying. And then in just a moment, I, I saw my mother coming, which elicited two very distinct feelings in my life, since my mother did not take kindly to being disobeyed. One was stark terror, because I knew what was going to happen when she got there, I thought. And the other was relief that I saw her coming because I was hurt. And on top of all that, I was skinned up a little bit. And my mother was convinced that mercurochrome could cure cancer, you know. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> if you remember mercurochrome. And so that was going to happen. <laughs> but my mother, being the 
wonderful mother she was. She's gone now. He knew that her son was hurting. And any kind of talk or discipline or anything else was not nearly as important to taking care of him. And she picked me up in her arms and took me home. And that's kind of how God is, folks. Even in the midst of our darkness, in the midst of our pain, God comes to us and picks us up and gives us strength and grace that we can be grateful for the fact that it make all the pain go away? No. But it made all the difference in the world that she was there. And the same thing with God. Does that make all the pain in the world go away? No. But it makes all the difference in the world. But that light and that epiphany of a long ago still shines. And the difference it makes is wonderful and awesome. Amen. Again, it's been my pleasure to be with you today. And Linda and I have enjoyed seeing several of our churches around from time to time. And this is my first time at Benbrook. But you have a lovely sanctuary and a lovely congregation. And I'm sure your pastor will be back next week. But thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Now, receive this. As we go in peace, O oh God, you're the God of grace. You're the God of light. You're the God that brings hope into the world. And regardless of where we are in our journey, we realize that you're there to hold our hand, to give us strength and resolve. And as we go in peace, we celebrate that with all the joy of all the nations. Amen.